In 1994, journalist Jonathan Weiner published The Beak of the Finch, a book about research into finches on the Galapagos Islands. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Weiner argued that finches represent the best and most detailed demonstration to date of the power of Darwin's process of natural selection. Similar claims are made in many biology textbooks. The Galapagos finches are a spectacular example of evolution. When the food quality, in other words, the kind of food that was available changed as a result of a drought or a particularly rainy year or something like that, over the course of just a couple of years, they could see dramatic changes in the beak sizes in various populations. Natural selection can drive changes of a structure, like the beak, in one direction in response to selective pressure, not just fast enough to account for what would be required for Darwin's theories, but actually 50 to 100 times faster than that. A severe drought could cause many of the finches to die and leave only those with larger beaks. So in the following generation, the average beak size was increased. And some textbooks extrapolate this over 200 years or so and say that a few of these events strung together could transform these finches into a new species by making their beaks larger. Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not confuse ourselves about that. Um, the question is, can it be extrapolated? Or does it represent cyclic variation? What the books fail to mention is that as soon as the rains came back, the average beak size returned to normal. There was no net evolution. What we're really seeing is just one species oscillating back and forth with no real evolutionary change. So the evidence is exaggerated to make it appear to support Darwin's theory in a way that it really doesn't. The contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years, there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. But we need a whole lot more by way of evidence than a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and. Uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more of this is to be serious science. I mean, this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Uh, finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape, too. It seems to be correlated with seasons. There seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the seasons change again. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. The changes are temporary, they oscillate back and forth, and they don't go anywhere. So. As evidence for the origin of species, Darwin's finches uh, really don't work. Critics of Darwin's theory say that finch beaks provide a good example of micro-evolution, small changes within a species or gene pool. But it does not by itself provide evidence for macro-evolution, which is the origin of fundamentally new organisms and body plans. Microevolution is what we can demonstrate in the laboratory in real time of organisms changing due to different environments. The extrapolation you know, to macroevolution is a quantum leap. We look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs, and we look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of the Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct.